Good morning. And welcome one and all. Happy New Year. A phenomenon noticeable throughout history, regardless of place or period, is the pursuit by governments of policies contrary to their own interests. Why do holders of high office so often act contrary to the way reason points and enlightened self-interest suggests? Why does intelligent mental process seem so often not to function? No one is as sure of their premise as the person who knows too little. This is a quotation from The March of Folly, written in the 1970s, historian Barbara Tuckman, who, in this book, examined the pervasive presence throughout the ages of failure, mismanagement, and delusion in government. It can be read as a deflating echo from a future ghost to a troubled world on the role of hubris, impulsivity, and entrenchment, which contributed to catastrophic results. The Trojans, taking the wooden horse within their walls, the Renaissance popes provoking the Protestant secession, the British loss of America, and the American self-betrayal in Vietnam all served as historical and avoidable examples. Tuckman defines folly as the pursuit by governments or organizations of policies contrary to their own interests, despite the availability of feasible alternatives. She died in 1989. One can only imagine how loudly her typewriter would be clacking had she lived longer. I would imagine that at this moment, many of you might reasonably be wondering why I've summoned our community here today. Is it that I thought a lecture on dusty old historians might be just a ticket to kick off the new calendar year? Or could it be that I've decided to run for office and I'm using this bully pulpit <laughs> to launch my candidacy? You should be relieved to know that neither is the case. I hope that in a few minutes, Tuckman's words will serve less as a prediction of future doom and more as an affirmation and motivation for us to remain institutionally awake, proud but humble, convinced that our work is worthy and honorable, but mindful that the wolf is lurking somewhere behind the carriage. We must pay attention to the path ahead, lest we catch our wheel in a rut and be overtaken. Cardigan's founders were risk takers, committed to finding the solution to a challenge. Although we are not fast-talking, fedora-wearing suits with lucky stripes dangling from our lips, our charge is a little different today than it was for the founders of Cardigan at the end of World War II when this school was imagined. When Hap Hinman helped found Cardigan Mountain School, it seemed to some that he was taking a giant leap of faith. But Hap had both vision and a vision. Despite an uncertain future and no promises of success, he worked with others to lay a foundation that has held strong for almost 75 years. The school continues as a legacy to their vision and as an example to each Cardigan boy. And make no mistake, they are young, impressionable boys. That he can achieve more than some will tell him is possible. I am here before you to remind our community that the same applies to us. Last June, the Chief Justice of the United States spoke to our graduates here on the point. The farther away that day gets, the more I realize what a special honor it was to have Chief Justice Roberts speak to our graduates and their families. It was my first commencement as head of school, and I was honestly so preoccupied with so many things, both great and small, from the tent uh, leaking rainwater to whether or not I'd be able to get any food at lunch that I don't remember being particularly blown away by the chief's message or specific remarks that day. In the days, weeks, and months that have followed, however, I have been reminded by so many people from all corners of the globe and with varying connections to the school that his address was spot on. I hope you will be treated unfairly so that you will come to know the value of justice, he told our graduates. I hope that you will suffer betrayal because that will teach you the importance of loyalty. Sorry to say, but I hope you will be lonely from time to time so that you don't take friends for granted. I wish you bad luck again from time to time 
so that you will be conscious of the role of chance in life and understand that your success is not completely deserved and that the failure of others is not completely deserved either. Whether I wish these things or not, they're going to happen. And whether you benefit from them or not will depend upon your ability to see the message in your misfortunes. Some of you know that Chief Justice Roberts initially rebuffed my invitation to speak, saying that he is inundated with requests and simplifies his life by refusing all of them. After I told him that I understood and began to move on to other topics of the conversation, he interrupted me and said, but I will do this one because Cardigan has helped our son in ways that we couldn't imagine. That, that Chief Justice Roberts captured the essence of Cardigan in his speech should be no surprise to any of us who knows his son, that his message went viral and has been viewed by hundreds of thousands worldwide is our good fortune. The sentiments of gratitude conveyed by Justice Roberts have no doubt been shared by hundreds, even thousands of parents since the school's founding. I will add that the reason Cynthia and I came to Cardigan and the principal reason that I am so honored to lead this community is because of the gifts that our boys Charlie and Henry were given and that they earned during their time here. And perhaps more importantly, how those gifts, those simple gifts of decency, kindness, hustle and hard work, respect for others, friend or foe, confidence and courage, and a sense of pride mixed with quiet humility at least for Charlie, how those, gifts, <laughs> how those gifts have been constantly realized in the years since they've left the point. That, my friends, is the value added that we don't often or always see on a daily basis in our work with the boys. And I'm not just speaking to the faculty here. The message that Chief Roberts gave to the boys last June applies to all, us all, and it took all of us to create it. There is no one here present strong enough to pull the weight of this community by his or herself. Only together can we and do we move forward. It has always been thus, and there can be no other path. This is an important realization for us all. While each of us has a discrete job here, Cardigan is successful only when those jobs come together harmoniously. This doesn't happen by chance, but by strategy. Cardigan Mountain School has long been guided by a strategic plan, informed by a range of community members, <clears throat> excuse me, from faculty, non-teaching staff, board members, parents, alumni, and the boys themselves. Our strategic plan serves as our map, our path forward. It is a living document that must be both a reminder of the importance of our traditions and roots and a call to evolve and thrive in a changing landscape. A thoughtful strategic plan beckons us to never become complacent or too self-satisfied, but also provides big picture perspective and a sense of righteous confidence in our mission. Yes, the wolf may be lurking somewhere behind us, but we know that our wagon is sturdy. The axles are well greased and our team is stout and steady and our driver focused on the path ahead. In 2012, Cardigan began an ambitious plan to assess the health of the school and identified strategies that will ensure a sustainable future. Program refinement, physical plant improvements, and commitment to financial sustainability are the big pillars of, that first, of the first two phases of the plan, each lasting about three years. With the completion of the strategic plan's second phase, the extraordinary achievements of the past seven years have, been placed, have placed the school in a position of strength. Advances in program are reflected in physical spaces with the familiar beauty of the point embracing improved facilities for athletics, residential life, academic, and community gatherings. The significant additions to endowment, currently at just over $30 million, may be less visible but are having a crucial impact on academic program, support for faculty, facilities maintenance, and financial aid. I've been at Cardigan for a year and a half now, and I've spent that time thinking seriously about the strategic plan for the school, about the strengths that we have here at Cardigan, and about the areas where I'm excited to lead us forward. Just as all of us in this chapel, I have my own reasons for choosing to be at Cardigan. I love this school and this community deeply, not because I have to, 
but because I believe in my core that Cardigan is worthy, worthy of our love and commitment. I'm convinced that its purpose and mission have never been more vital. But Cardigan also had a reason for choosing me. My predecessors did some incredibly hard work to put this school into position of strength, a position that you, will, that you all work to earn and justify every single day. I was invited to step into this role not to squander that opportunity, but to capitalize on it. I am here to take my passion for program and turn it into a vision for Cardigan that embraces our strengths, that tests them, that pushes them forward. I've spent my career in independent school education as a teacher, coach, dorm parent, and administrator. If I've been successful, it's because I've never once felt like I was punching a clock or doing a job. Like you, I have some days that are better than others, and like you, I'm not always the person I'd like everyone to think I am. Each of us in this chapel has taken a path that has led us to be in this place, in your very seat today. Fortunately, I now realize, my path included tumultuous middle school years, which features a, featured a roller coaster of successes and failures, risks sometimes rewarded, and mistakes most of the time punished. We each bring our experiences into our work and lives in order to contribute to something bigger than we are. We must all be leaders and followers at times. We need each other, and our boys need us. As we move toward Cardigan's 75th anniversary in 2020, we are in a position to embark on the next phase, phase three of the strategic plan. Each priority from phases one and two remains active during this, this, uh, during this phase. Our work to get better will never be complete. And a particular focus now is to reinforce Cardigan's role as a leader in middle school education. Earlier successes now, allowed us, now allow us to boldly pursue our leading and founding vision, to offer a close-knit community that prepares middle school boys in mind, body, and spirit for responsible and meaningful lives in a global society. This ongoing process requires participants to examine the school with clear eyes and yet envision a bold future that fulfills the high standards of our mission. The results are captured in the strategic plan for Cardigan 2020, a working document that describes paths to achieving school priorities. A bold vision inspires collaboration, producing remarkable achievements, some of which are visible to the eye around campus and many of which are not. All share equally in the overall health of the school. Everything we do starts with the question, what is best for the boys? That has been the question that Cardigan has asked for 75 years. The answer, however, has always been a bit different. Think of how different our world is from the one Hap Hinman inhabited in 1945. The rise, and perhaps fall, of American, of, of American global hegemony the relative decline of Europe and the consequential rise of Asia, political Islam as a global force, the changing role of human rights, and the explosive evolution of technology in the world just scratches the surface. Cardigan boys face an uncertain future. The world is changing. Technologies are changing. Employment opportunities are changing. It's estimated that Two-thirds of the jobs that middle school boys of today will have haven't even been imagined yet. Every year that goes by makes you and I seemingly more antiquated. Aha, but we're not. We have a responsibility. We, the adults in the lives of these bouncing balls of hormones, sinew, and muscle, have a crucial role to play. Listen to the noise in our lives today. You and I know that much of it is not healthy. It seems we are captivated by it. Here, though, here on the point, we can slow things down and filter the noise just a bit, just long enough to make a difference, perhaps change the world. We, as the adults in the lives of the boys, we who are responsible for preparing them for that unknown future, we don't know which specific skills our boys will need or what tools they will use. What we do know is that character, imagination, and determination 
will help them navigate any environment they'll encounter. That is the gift we give them. That is the gift Cardigan has always given its boys. So, we are going to double down on what we do best. We're going to take our strength, building character in the classroom, on the fields, in the dorms, and we're going to take it even farther. We're going to start a movement in middle school education, and everyone in this room is going to help. I'm sharing, with this, you uh, I'm sharing this with you now, because as a community, we're about to roll up our sleeves and dive into the nitty gritty. This afternoon, the teaching faculty will gather to share our hopes and concerns for the process. It's a first step in an undertaking that will play out over the course of the next two to three years. While staying true to our core, we are going to amplify the excellence that happens within each classroom by knocking down walls, both real and imagined, allowing these lessons to resonate between departments and across grades. We're going to create more spaces for fearless learning. Both in, our, uh, both in our spaces and in our schedule. We will rethink our curricula, we will rethink how we develop as professional educators, and we will rethink our academic facilities. We owe it to the future to do this work, and we will do it together. I started this talk by referencing an historian who focused on historical failure, or folly, as she called it. Not to cast gloom over our future, but as a reminder that we must all pay attention to what we know deeply is important, but also be smart enough to know that there is more that we don't know than that we do. Fortune may favor the bold, and bold will be. But when the commodity is the growth and guidance of middle school boys, the measure of true fortune may be a bit more vexing, thank goodness. I look forward to tackling this puzzle together in the years to come and know that we have the horses in place to pull this carriage. Thank you all for being here this morning and once again, Happy New Year.